Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, I did not seek this invitation. You sent it. Then having put your hands on me for this assignment, I'm asking you, Father, with great respect, but with a sense of desperation, help me to do what you sent me to do. First of all, forgive me where I have offended you. Cleanse me from, an, from sin, dear God. Give me a hatred for sin and a love for that which is right in your sight. I ask you, Father, grant me your words. Jesus said in John 6, 63, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. My words save no one, Father. So help me to restrain my opinions and just present, Thus saith the Lord. Father, I do not know what is in the hearts of the people sitting before me. Someone may have turned me off because he or she doesn't like my shirt or my suit or my color or whatever. I just don't know. But you know, because you know, Father, you cover me by directing my thinking and my speaking. And now bless every person under the sound of my voice and a double blessing on their children, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Genesis 1, reading from verse 1. The subject of this evening's message will be given in the middle of the message. Genesis 1, reading from verse 1. Welcome to those of you coming in. We shall let you find a comfortable seat somewhere before we begin to read. So no one is distracted. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from what verse? Who wrote Genesis? Moses, yes. Who wrote Exodus? Leviticus? Numbers? Deuteronomy? All of Deuteronomy? What about the chapter that talks about the death of Moses? Welcome. Nice to see you. Love to see children in the house of God. God bless you. Thank all children, raise your hands. Let me see you. Children, raise your hands. All right. Okay. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Bless the children. Children learn a lot more than we think. Always make sure they are where the word of God is preached. They will pick up more than you think. The same way they pick up evil just like that. They can pick up what's right just like that. Genesis 1, reading from verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning, finish the verse, were the first day, the first one. What was made on day one? Light. In John 8, 12, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Light in the Bible symbolizes, among other things, life. John 1 verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so on day one, God made something which he subsequently used in his word to represent eternal life. And he tells his people, the same way I am the light of the world, John 8, 12, ye are the light of the world, of course, reflecting the light of Christ, made on the first day. Let us go to verse 6 of Genesis 1. The Bible says, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament, what? Heaven. And the evening and the morning, finish the verse, were the second day. We have two days, the firmament on day two. Psalm 19 verse 1, 
The heavens declare the glory of God. Finish that verse. And the firmament, the heavens declare glory, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. What was made on day two is filled to capacity with evidences of the goodness of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Light on the first day, representing eternal life, representing Jesus Christ himself. The firmament on the second day, it is filled with the goodness and the majesty and the evidence of God's power. Let's look at day three, verse 11 of Genesis 1. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. The same one who said, let there be grass, let the earth bring forth grass. Who said that, by the way? Jesus Christ, yes. It was Christ who said, let there be light, let there be, let there be, all the way through Genesis 1. We have Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It was Jesus Christ who spoke. He is the creator. Some of you look shocked. Jesus Christ is the creator. And the same one who said, let the earth bring forth grass. Here's what he says in Matthew 6 verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? And so Christ points to grass as having a relationship with God. If God so clothe the grass of the field. Ella White writes in Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1081, paragraph 4, I believe it is. She says, God has given his life to the vines and the trees of his creation. That, of course, also includes grass. If God so clothe the grass of the field. Day one, he made light. Christ is the light of the world. Day two, the firmament. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day three, he made grass. Also on day four, he made trees, vegetation. We know there's a tree of life from which we will eat when we get into that new world. Let's look at day four, verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. So we have sun, moon, and stars, and the sun is used of Christ. He is the sun of righteousness that arises, how? With healing in his wings. And so part of the fourth day creation, the sun, is used in the Bible to represent Christ. Let's go to day five. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. In Matthew 6, verse 26, Jesus says, behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feed of them. Grass has a relationship with God. Birds have a relationship with God. In verse 28, consider the lilies of the field. Flowers have a relationship with God. We go to day 6, verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. From day 6, are chosen the animals that represent Jesus Christ. The bull, the goat, the kid, the lamb. And back on day five, we read, behold the fowls of the air. We also know that part of the sacrifices that could be brought were pigeons and turtle doves. On day one, light. Christ is the light of the world. On day two, the firmament is sureth his handiwork. On day three, vegetation. He cares for the grass. There's a tree of life from which we eat. On day four, the sun, moon, and stars. He is the sun of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. Day five, the fish, the birds. He cares 
for the birds. Birds were part of the offerings brought by the poor. Day six, land animals from which were chosen the animals that were fit to be offered as sacrifices. Now, why am I saying all of that? Every day seemed to have been a special day from which God drew something which we find in the Bible subsequently. But let's go to chapter 2 of Genesis 1. And Genesis 2, sorry, reading from verse 1. Genesis 2, reading from verse 1, it's a quarter to eight. When you found it, say amen. amen. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, what did God create on the seventh day? Now, what did he create? Nothing. Nothing. He rested on that day, but he created nothing. So there was nothing in that day Nothing is never used to symbolize anything about God. Are you with me? Light is, firmament, sun, moon, stars, birds, animals, land animals, vegetation, yes, but not nothing. Yet, God has a relationship with that day that he does not have with the day on which light was made. He has a relationship with that day that places that day above day one through day six. Listen to God. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, say it with me, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. He does not refer to the first day that way. Yes, they're all his days, for when God separated light from darkness, he made the day. On every day he created. But God does not call Wednesday his day or Friday or Tuesday, certainly not Sunday. He calls the seventh day my holy day. He has elevated that day above all other days, even though they were all made by God. The seventh day has a higher status in God's eyes than the other six. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Let's go back to verse 11 of Genesis 1. As I deliver this message tonight, I want to follow two of Ellen White's counsels, two of them, of the many she gives to preachers. One, don't give the audience too much at any one time. And two, don't preach long. You're guaranteed not to get too much at any one time. That's a guarantee. I'm not sure if I can give you a guarantee for the other one, but I will try. What verse did I say we go back to? Of what chapter? Of what book? And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. Now, let's go up to Matthew now, look at grass again. Matthew 6, verse 30. Matthew 6, verse 30, we're looking at grass which God made. That we walk on without thinking twice. And we thank God for grass. One of the most beautiful things a house can have is a nicely manicured lawn. Do you have Matthew 6 verse 30? The Bible says, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, what do we call that? Here today, gone tomorrow. Brief lifespan. If God so clothe the grass of the field, we have grass which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, read the next statement, shall he not much more clothe you? Now we have grass and we have what? You. Which one stands higher in God's estimation? You. But let's go, just listen to Genesis 1 verse 20, but stay in Matthew 6. Just listen. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Let's look at the fowls or the birds. Let's go to Matthew 6, 26. 
Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Finish that verse. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Now we had grass and you. Now we have birds and you. Which stands higher in God's divine estimation? You. My brothers and sisters, let's go to Acts. No, before Acts, let's go to Genesis 1. Don't go there. Say it with me, Genesis 1.26. Don't go, just say it. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's enough. So we have sun, moon, and stars. We have light. We have vegetation. We have birds. We have land animals. Now we have man. Now let's go to Acts 17. We read from verse 22 of Acts 17. Our subject will come in a few minutes. Ten minutes to eight. Acts 17. What verse did I say? 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Read 26 with me now. And have made, come on, I can't hear you. And have made, come on, of one blood all nations of men go on for to dwell on all the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of the habitation. And have made of one blood, what? All nations of men. So God is the one responsible for the variety of uh, human beings that are on the face of the earth. He hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of the habitation. So Asians are not in Asia by accident. You know, the blacks are not in Africa by accident. The Caucasians not in Europe by accident. God hath determined now, they have been traveling, yes, I understand. But God originally determined the bounds, this is where you'll be. But he hath made of one blood all nations of men. Now, we're getting to the title. God made seven days. Is there one that's more dear to him than the other six? Yes, name it. Seventh day. God made grass. And he said, I clothe the grass. But if I clothe the grass, how much more will I clothe you? So we have grass, we have human beings. Who is higher? Human beings. Jesus said, Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. If I feed birds not made in my image, surely I will feed you. We have birds that are higher than grass, and we have people who stands high in God's estimation. We do. You can go from birds to animals. Now we have all nations of men. Is there one that's closer to God than all the other nations? Don't answer me. Is there a nation as there is a day that is dearer to God than any other nation on the face of the earth. Let me make it simpler for you. Was there a nation? Ah, okay. I'm not a good teacher. My apologies. Was there a nation closer to God than any other nation on the face of the earth? Yes. Name the nation, the Israelites. That's by God's conscious choice. Listen to, to be like Jesus, page 161, paragraph 3. Every promise in the Bible, every ray of light which have shone upon us from the word of God has come to us through the Jewish nation.
Let me say it again. The reference to be like Jesus. Page 161, paragraph 3. Every promise in the Bible, and there are thousands, without exception, every ray of light which has shone upon us from the word of God has come to us through the Jewish nation. Now that is a privilege that placed them above all other nations on the face of the earth. In Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8, the Bible tells us, For he that toucheth you, finish the verse, toucheth the apple of his eye. This was the Israelites. The apple of God's eye, I say again, above every other nation, God is a God who is closer to some than he is to others. The Desire of Ages, page 524, paragraph 1. What book did I say? What page? What paragraph? The Savior bless all who sought his help. He loves all the human family. John 3.16. But to some, he is bound by peculiarly tender associations. His heart was knit by a strong bond of affection to the family at Bethany. Name the members of that family. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. His heart was bound, by, knit by a strong bond of affection to the family at Bethany, and for one of them, his most wonderful work was wrought. Jesus Christ deliberately reserved his mightiest miracle for the family closest to him. Read the chapter which is called Lazarus Come Forth in Desire of Ages, and you will see where Ellen White writes, that miracle was the one that put the stamp on Christ's claim to be divine. Not the raising of the widow's uh, of Nain's son. Not raising Jairus' daughter. Not feeding 5,000. Raising Lazarus who had begun to decay. Was the miracle Ellen White writes that put the stamp on his claim to divinity, and he reserved it for a special family. They were closer to him than any other family. They were the apple of his eye. Christ had 12 disciples. On very special occasions, with whom, who went with him by his choice? Peter, James, and John. The others were left for reasons best known to Christ. What we learn from that is Christ was closer to Peter, James, and John than he was to the other nine. How many of them did he love? All 12. How many did he desire to prepare for his kingdom? All 12. Of course, only 11 will make it. Judas chose not to. God is closer to some than he is to others. He has always been that way. In the Desire of Ages, page 761, paragraph 5, writing of Lucifer, Ellen White gives us these words, To him, as to no other created being, was given a revelation of God's love. God showed Lucifer a depth of his love that he consciously withheld from the other angels. In the faith I live by, page 66, paragraph 2, also writing of Lucifer, she writes these words. God made him good and beautiful, as near as possible like himself. That applies to no other angel, including Gabriel. What am I trying to say? I am about to move from the Old Testament and the New to now. Now, God no longer has a nation. That ended with, I think, Zedekiah. When the prophecy overthrow, overthrow, overturn, 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 and it happened when the Medes came and the uh, Grecians came and then the Romans came. 
And now Christ is waiting when the kings of this world shall be king to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So God no longer has a nation on this earth. My kingdom is not of this world. That will be reestablished when Christ comes back. But he does he have a people who are dearer to him than any of the people on the face of the earth. Don't say yes so anemically. What's the answer? Yes. Now, listen to Ellen White's quotation again. To be like Jesus, page 161, paragraph 3. Every promise in the Bible, every ray of light which has shone upon us from the word of God has come to us from the Jewish nation. But Romans says he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Romans 2, 28. He is a Jew who is one inwardly. When Christ said, your house is left unto you desolate, and then subsequently Paul said, seeing you reject our teaching, we go to the Gentiles. You consider yourself, judge yourself unworthy, we go to the Gentiles. When in AD 34, the message went to the Gentiles, God no longer had a political entity on this earth. But he called people to form a spiritual nation. Are you following me? The Jews were both physical and the spiritual nation. L. White writes, when he called them out of Egypt, he called them to form them into a nation church. The entire nation was a church. The entire church was a nation. And all the standard of conduct God had for them were the Ten Commandments. Let me say that differently and slower. When God called the Israelites out of Egypt, he called them to form them into a nation church. They were not a nation in Egypt. They were just a group of people. They were far, far less were they a church. He called them out to organize them into a nation church. In other words, everything you do, Sabbath or not, will be reflective of the lifestyle in heaven. And all he gave them originally with the Ten Commandments. Listen to Ellen White in Patriots and Prophets, page 364, paragraph 2. If man had kept the commandments of God as given to Adam after his fall, preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham, there would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant of which circumcision was a sign, they would never have been seduced into idolatry, neither would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. And had the people practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need for the additional directions given to Moses. So all these statutes and judgments and precepts we find in the Bible were the result of the fact that the people would not keep the, cent the core of what God wanted, the Ten Commandments. I say again, when God called the Israelites out of Egypt to organize them into a nation church, all he desired of them were, was the Ten Commandments. Now let's look at the people in the end time. See if we can identify the apple of God's eye today. Go to Revelation 12. You read verse 17. No, let's read from verse 7. Revelation 12. We'll read from verse 7 our subject, the apple of his eye. Two minutes after eight. What book did I say? What chapter? Seven. Reading from what verse? Seven. When you found it, say Amen. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. By the way, the same way Lucifer failed, well, he lost the battle in heaven. Through Christ, he can lose the battle in your life. Okay, that amen was lifeless, weak. Let me say it again. It's my fault. Let me say it again. The same way he prevailed not in heaven. Through Christ, he can lose in your life every day of the week and there was war in heaven where is heaven michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not neither was the place found anymore in heaven and the great dragon was cast out 
That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth where? The whole world. He was cast out into the earth. Come on, finish the verse. And his angels were cast out with him. Now we have a transfer of a conflict from one battlefield to the next. The conflict hasn't changed its nature. It hasn't changed its objective. It is still directed against Christ. But having been thrown out, having lost when Christ came to this earth, 33 and a half years, now the devil still wants to get at Christ, but he gets at Christ through that which is the apple of Christ's eye. Tell me what that is. The church. But there are churches many. Every church is not the apple of God's eye, even though Jesus said, other sheep I have, which are not of this fault, them also I must bring. So there are sheep in other churches that belong to Christ, but they are in churches that do not belong to Christ. So the battle has come to the earth. Now we go to verse 17 of Revelation 12, our subject, the apple of his eye. Read verse 17 with me. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Stop. Woman. That is, yes, but that is singular. How many women are in Revelation? Two? Would you like to do some more calculations? How many women are in Revelation? Okay, name the two. Where are they? Revelation 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in pain, in birth and pain to be delivered. Revelation 12, 1 and 2. That's one woman. Where's the other woman? Revelation 17. The woman's arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold, precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, filled with abomination and filthiness of her fornication. Okay, two. But are they really just two? Listen to verse 5 of Revelation 17. Go to Revelation 17. Let's read verse 5 and see how many women are in Revelation. The apple of his eye, six minutes after eight. Do you have Revelation 17? Nobody on this side said anything. I don't know what my problem is with you, but you said nothing. Do you have Revelation 17? Ah, God bless you for being good looking. Okay, and verse 5. Read with me. What does it say? And upon her head, come on. Was name written? Come on, Mystery Babylon the Great. Read carefully. The mother of harlots. Stop. How many harlots? Many. What does each harlot represent? A church. A woman. So there are many women in Revelation, but only two kinds. If that's clear, say amen. Friends on the left. There are many women in Revelation, only two kinds. Elmite writes in Christ's Object Lessons, page 283, paragraph 3. There are only two classes in the world today, and only two classes will be recognized in the judgment those who violate God's law and those who obey. Do I need to say that again? Okay. What book did I say? What page? What paragraph? There are only two classes in the world today. That goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. And only two will be recognized in the judgment. Those who violate God's law and those who obey. Now we have discovered there are many women in Revelation, but only two kinds. Now, having that in mind, let's read Revelation 12, 17 again. Read with me. And the dragon was wroth with the woman which means then you've got to pick this woman out of a multitude of women as you try to identify the apple of his eye and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed a remnant is just like the original we have, we have like a mixed metaphor, remnant and seed, but fine. Uh, apple seed can only produce what? Mm -hmm. Not mango. Apples. 
went to make war with the remnant of her seed, finish the verse. Which, now you need not to, don't look in the Bible for that. You're Seventh-day Adventist. Say the whole verse for me. Stop cheating, stop cheating. Ah, uh, this is not good, this is not good, this is not good. You may have me deported back to Michigan, but this is not good. This is a Seventh-day Adventist gathering. Are you ashamed of yourself? Say yes. Good. <laughs> and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. Stop. What did God give the Israelites when he brought them out? The commandments, and that was all he required. That was the standard of conduct that would separate them from the rest of the world. He gave them his will. He gave them his law, something he did to no other nation. Now, other nations had uh, impressions, you see, when the, when the, what was it, the Gentile do by nature the things contained in the law. Are you following me? You have impressions, I shouldn't do that. But the Jews had it verbatim from God's mouth. That set them apart from any other nation. God gave them his will because God's law is his will. Signs of the Times, September 24, 1894, paragraph 4. It is the prerogative of God alone to prescribe the duty of men and angels. God's will is a perfect will. And must be obeyed as it is set forth in his holy law. Because every requirement is just and is set forth by infinite wisdom. The law of God should be obeyed even though there were no authority to enforce it. And no reward for its obedience. The highest interests of men and angels are conserved in obeying the law of God. God's will expressed in his law is the supreme will. And no invention, no device of man can take its place. Obedience to the commandments of men instead of the commandments of God will be as abomination in the sight of God. For what God requires is essential to the highest good of his subjects and is there so essential for the glory of God. God gave his law to the descendants of Abraham. And made them different from every other nation on the face of the earth. Listen to what he tells them in Exodus 19 verse 4 and verse 5. And I, I'm coming down to the downslope of this message. Exodus 19, 4 and 5. Let's go there quickly. Our subject, the apple of his eye. God is a God with favorites. But he's also fair. Anything he does is right. He gave one man five talents. He gave one two. It was not numerically equal, but it was fair. Why? Because God did it. Exodus 19, verse 4. Read with me. He has seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, read the verse with me. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then stop. Then, what does then mean? Condition. Mm -hmm. Sequence of events. This, then that. If you obey my voice indeed, the only way to obey God is to obey his word. And keep my covenant, or God calls it his covenant. He had not yet spoken the covenant on Sinai with Moses. He's, this is Exodus 19. He refers to the Ten Commandments as his covenant. It wasn't an agreement. It was a requirement he had. That when he spoke the covenant to Moses, then the Ten Commandments became the basis of the covenant. You can't separate the two. If you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. Finish the verse. Above all nations. All the earth is mine. But you will occupy a place in my affections that no other nation occupies. If you keep my commandments. Now, listen to the church in the end time. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So we have the woman. 
We have the seed, then we have the remnant. The remnant is towards the end of time, that's now. Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. An unmissable mark of God's apple is the church that honors, promotes, defends, and teaches the ten commandments of God. Let me say it boldly. The apple of God's eye today is the church organized in 1863 in Michigan. <laughs> the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Listen to that half-dead amen. Say it again. Amen. Ah, one more time. Amen. Don't make me sorry I came. When you don't realize who you are, you behave like everybody else. Let me say it again. When you do not understand who you are, you look to others to tell you who you are. And so Adventists who do not understand what it means to be a special people to whom God has given light, he's given to no one else in history. When you don't understand that, you run around trying to be a Pentecostal. You run around trying to be a Catholic. And God bless them all, don't misunderstand me. But I don't see Mormons running around trying to be Adventists. I don't see Jehovah's Witnesses trying to look like Adventists. We want to look like everybody except a genuine Seventh-day Adventist, the apple of God's eye that can be demonstrated biblically. My brothers and my sisters, I'm closing. God has always had a special people. He has never had two special people. His special people in the Bible, the Israelites. His special people today, spiritual Israel, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. As the Israelites were to prepare the world for the first coming of Christ, we are to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. We have a burden, a duty, and a responsibility. To take what God has given us, this unspeakable privilege. Elway tells us God has given light to this church. He's never given to any mortal on the face of the earth. He's given to us what Paul didn't have. Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Joel, Amos, Daniel, Jose. They didn't have it. Now we have what all those guys had. We had what all the New Testament people have. We have light from our prophet. Say amen. What's her name? Uh-huh. I'm glad you know. We have all of that, and we have fulfilled prophecy. You don't go to CNN to find out what's going on. You go to Adventist. Uh, you didn't hear me. Uh, it's going to be hard camp meeting for me I can see that let me say it again people go to MSNBC to try to explain what's going on in the world people go to CBS NBC ABC uh, headline news and uh, whatever ESPN when Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know what was going on he called MSNBC CNN but he called the war those in his day you see he called all of them they were called magicians astrologers sorcerers Chaldeans they said what's going on we don't know you don't want, you don't know. You better know something. Quick. They didn't know. Then one man came, a Seventh day Adventist called Daniel. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> he knew. When Pharaoh, hundreds of years before, had two dreams seven fat cows, seven thin cows, the thin devoured the fat. Seven blasted airs of corn, seven good airs. The blasted if I were the good, he didn't know what was going on. He called, he did the same thing. He got all his magicians and witch doctors and root doctors and we don't know. We don't know. But we know a guy who would tell you. 
He's in prison for the truth. He's an Adventist. His name is Joseph. Joseph comes, tells Pharaoh clearly, this is not from me, this is from God. Tells him what's going on. When Pharaoh wanted to understand what was going on, the only one who could explain world events in his time was an Adventist. Now you keep saying, why did this, by, this guy call these two men Adventists? Medical ministry, page 49, paragraph 4, Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. I just can't get a lively amen from you, no matter what I do. I guess maybe if I got up on a cross and died, you'd say amen. Medical ministry, page 49, paragraph 4, Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. So if he were on the earth now, he had to join the church. Finish my words. He joined this church. The apple of his eye. That's you. But to whom much is given, much is required. I want to appeal to you tonight. There's a young man in Kenya. I'll see him in October. He'd been listening to my sermons somewhere on YouTube. And he came to the cruise that I had last August in Nairobi. And uh, he heard, he, he's, I'd meet him every, every night after the service, give him a hug, talk to him, encourage him. And he said, let me ask my mother if I should get baptized. I, he's 21 or 20. I said, your mother? God bless all mothers, but how old are you, six? You're a man. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And fortunately, the mother said, do what you want to do. He got baptized, very faithful. And so he sent me a text yesterday on uh, Twitter, I guess. He said, I want to study the history of my church. What resources can you recommend? I was so excited. When I was a little boy, denominational history was a big thing in the church. Are you with me? You studied how the church began. And it changed your view of who you are in this church. But today, the average Adventist cannot tell you how this church began. And so all they know is, instead of going to church on Sunday, I go on Saturday, and that's it. But he wants to know. And I know as he learns, he'll become stronger. And so I told him when I come in October, I'll bring him some resources so he can have it for himself. My brothers and sisters, study the history of this church. We often say the church was founded by Ellen White, James White, Jane Andrews, uh, Jane Loughborough. And, uh, no, it was founded by Christ. But Christ called them the same way he founded the early church, by calling the 12 disciples. Can you say amen to that? It was founded by Christ. The apple of his eye. Tonight, I ask God, give me the grace to live like someone who is aware that he is part of the group that is the apple of God's eye. And let that awareness affect my speech, my dress, my diet, how I handle money, my relationship with the world, my interaction with whomever. Let that consciousness that I am a member of a special group affect how I behave. How many will say, Lord, help me to live as if I believe I am a member of your special people. Can I see your right hand? Help me to live that way. Stand up with me. The apple of his eye. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear God, if I preach badly, forgive me. Sometimes in my eagerness to provide information, I may go too quickly or say too much. I ask you, dear God, to salvage whatever you can from this message and apply it with additional force to the heart of everyone who heard. I just can't assume, dear God, because they listened that they understood everything. Your spirit has to go now again. And as they meditate on what they've heard, as they reflect, God, show them what they missed in this live presentation. Father in heaven, 
we are not like everyone else. We are part of a group raised up by Christ the same way Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and all those Jewish leaders were part of a group raised up by you. As your servant says, God has called his church in this day as he called ancient Israel. Please, God, help us to study your word, study the history of this movement, that we may understand who we are, particularly in these last days. Because we have an understanding of truth absolutely no one else on earth has. Help us not simply to have it as head knowledge, dear God, but let it be a principle by which we live our lives from day to day. Bless every man, woman, boy, and girl, dear God. Let us reflect on what we've heard. Bring us back tomorrow to hear the presentations from the first to the last. And with every day that passes, dear God, let us climb the ladder of sanctification.